today's World Insight with Chen Wei. Broader ties with a close amigo of China. Chinese President Xi Jinping visits Spain. And a documentary trying to answer crucial questions. Can China and the U.S. coexist peacefully are, uh, and create common we ground? We are uh, certainly not in this film trying to make a pro-China or a pro-America film. The film is pro-America and China getting along. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. We begin in the Spanish capital, Madrid, where Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived for a three-day state visit. It's the first visit by the Chinese head of state to the country in 13 years. President Xi says he seeks to consolidate traditional friendships and strengthen bilateral cooperation. Before the discussion on Xi's trip, take a look. Spain. The first stop of President Xi Jinping's visit to Europe and Latin America. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez rolled out the red carpet for President Xi at La Moncloa Palace. Earlier, President Xi met King Felipe VI of Spain, while the mayor of Madrid, Manuela Carmena, gave President Xi the gold key to Spain's capital. The president then delivered the speech at the Spanish Senate. China-Spain relations are now facing new opportunities. China will always look at our ties with a long-term perspective. We hope the two countries can continue to support each other on issues of mutual concern. We also want to enhance communication and development and cooperate under the Belt and Road Initiative to improve our bilateral ties. This year marks the 45th anniversary of diplomatic relations between China and Spain, as well as the 13th anniversary of their comprehensive strategic partnership. Bilateral trade has increased in recent years. China is now Spain's largest trading partner outside the EU, while Spain is the sixth largest trading partner of China within the EU. In 2013, China launched the Belt and Road Initiative. Spain, located at the intersection of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, has taken an active part in the BRI to promote pragmatic cooperation with China. During President Xi's visit to Spain, the two countries have published a joint statement and signed documents to step up collaboration in the third-party markets, service trade, taxation, culture, science and technology, and finance. The Chinese president's nine-day trip will also take him to Portugal, Panama, and Argentina. He will attend the G20 summit in the Argentinian capital, Buenos Aires. For more on Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Spain, we are in our Beijing studio having Cui Hongjian, who is the director of the Department of European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome. In Barcelona, we have Augusto Soto, the director of the Dialogue with China project at China Today. Welcome as well. Uh, Mr. Soto, you are in Madrid. Help me to understand what will this visit bring to the bilateral relations. After all, it is the first of its kind since 2005, heads of state from China to Spain. Mr. Soto? Yeah. Yes. Um, we are extremely happy to participate in this uh, program. Um, I think I represent the view of uh, of the Spanish citizens and analysts and authorities, I would say that we are um, extremely happy for this visit of President Xi Jinping. Uh, his visit um, is really reinforcing our strategic partnership. Um, we are very curious to develop further what is being signed right now in Spain, all of these agreements in a new era. We are facing lots of uncertainties right now in the international global scenario and uh, I think we should be uh, more uh, uh, get closer and closer and uh, this is a, a very important day so I see. to mark a new I we could not say new beginning but the continuation of this friendship very strong friendship we'll see how strong it is 
adjectives easy to use, but when it comes to concrete content, uh, should we read more carefully? China Spain enjoy long history of cooperation, that's for sure. 2005, it signed a comprehensive strategic partnership, and this relationship was sealed in November 2014 with the freight train line between the Chinese city Yiwu and the Spanish capital of Madrid opened that, that year. In 2017, bilateral trade volume reached 31 billion U.S. dollars as well. But, Mr. Tui, uh, of course, if you look at China-Spain trade, there is still a big uh, uh, deficit for Spain right now. Will this visit change the picture? Yes, as we know, I think it's also a very big yeah, concern I think so. from the uh, uh, sp uh, Spanish side to uh, get some more maybe a balance uh, of trade with China. But I think it could not be uh, uh, totally changed in a very short term. Because as we know, it's not only an issue of uh, uh, who uh, uh, import, export, how much. And I think, uh, indeed, it's an issue of uh, uh, structure. For example, so far, the most of the uh, uh, trade between uh, uh, for Spain is with some uh, European, uh, European Union member states. And also, of course, I think uh, still, we can find out maybe a new uh, uh, space for, uh, you know, promote the battle trade with China right. uh, well, between two countries. As we know, last year, but I think now China did a lot to help this uh, uh, balance of uh, trade. For example, last year, China uh, imported a lot, uh, much more than it uh, uh, exported to, um, to Spain. So I think in long term, it could be get a, a better situation for I this see. Uh, trade issue. You see issue. China is trying to host the CIIE, the first ever import expo, the first of its kind in the world, one could argue. And meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping going to Spain, Mr. Soto, that uh, the two sides are signing uh, documents regarding to cut off double taxation between the two countries and also to try to seek some cooperation in the field of agricultural products such as ham import into China, which is a big uh, issue for Spain. Uh, will these measures be able to help both sides to understand the sincerity of this relationship? Uh, Mr. Soto, very briefly. Uh, I, I think so. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm convinced these measures will really um, be uh, quite useful for um, diminishing that, that gap. I think very important now is to move forward to act in fair markets. All right. When you talk about moving forward, there are a lot of issues that the two parts could work together. For example, uh, Mr. Choi, a Belt and Road Initiative, we understand that not yet any memorandum being signed, and yet Chinese companies have been working with major ports in Spain, for example, in Valencia, uh, Bilbao, and yeah. also yeah. in uh, Barcelona. Uh, these are major ports inside Spain, and they certainly provide a very crucial sea route for the possible uh, maritime Silk Road that China has been proposing, which is seeking partnership from all over the world. And Mr. Choi, how will Spain eventually be a part of the destiny in terms of destinations, rather, in terms of Belt and Road Initiative? Yes, as we know, I think firstly, uh, Spain had a very, very good and uh, advantageous, I mean, uh, geographic uh, uh, points. As we know, uh, now uh, Spain was regarded as a joint uh, points between the uh, Belt and the Zoot uh, in the frame of uh, BRI. Mm -hmm. So we can find that now uh, in some uh, ports and also uh, infrastructure, China and Spain, we can do something a lot. Besides this, uh, uh, you know, cooperation in ports uh, in Spain, now we do have also this, um, uh, you know, uh, freight uh, uh, train between uh, EU and uh, Madrid. I think mm. all of them uh, will be in the frame of uh, BRI. Regarding to the MOU of BRI, I don't think it's a single, I mean, a standard to uh, judge that uh, we, we do have some cooperation in BRI or not. Mm. I, I'm, I'm a, uh, I prefer to some more pragmatic cooperation in the spread of uh, BRI, also in the regulation or the rule of BRI. Mm. Mr. Soto, your thought here. Uh, uh, my opinion on this, uh, I, I completely agree. Uh, beyond a memorandum of understanding, 
considering the Belt and Road Initiative, what matters here right now for us, we are within the European Union, and we at the same time are quite pragmatic. And we believe that the practice is the sole criterion of truth as well. And so we're actively moving forward in the Belt and Road Initiative, considering that a train reaches us in, in Madrid, starting in you, and that our ports along the Mediterranean coast are, uh, coast are really w uh, actively working in order to get a closer cooperation uh, with China. So we are moving fast, uh, uh, either uh, in the landmass and, uh, or and, uh, 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 via maritime uh, connections. Right. Mr. Soto, if you talk about the cooperation between China and Spain, you see some very interesting combination of phenomena. On the one hand, China has been aspiring to develop a relationship with uh, both uh, uh, Central and the Southern European countries that has been uh, developing over the past few years, which of course has caused some debates within the European Union about what China's agenda is and why China will be so much interested in developing closer ties with these countries. Uh, Spain, of course, included in that. On the other hand, though, you also see, even among these uh, southern European countries, let's just say Spain and Portugal, there is competition as to who gets more attention from China, more investment, more opportunities being created for cooperation. So how is Spain going to uh, balance these different sides of the same issue and seek the right proportion and the way to work with China? Mr. Soto. Well, uh, we are a single country on one side, and at the same time, we are part of the European Union, and we have to consider that. We know that China has, uh, at the same time, uh, privileged time, uh, ties with uh, Eastern Europe right now, 16 plus 1, that formula, and we believe that uh, uh, we can cooperate as uh, members of the EU as a, whole, as a whole. We are one country, but at the same time, we work with another supranational umbrella, which is uh, the European Union. And for us, there is no contradiction. We just move uh, forward acting the way we've been doing right now, but beyond uh, with agreements and sometimes without big agreements, like the Belt and Road Initiative. We are quite active, and we are here able um, to offer China our cooperation um, uh, for synergies with Northern Africa and with synergies in Latin America. We have very close contacts with these countries, China as well, direct countries with Northern Africa and with Latin American countries, but we feel that we can uh, bring a, a plus. We have very mm -hmm. uh, um, strong interests in Latin American telecommunications, infrastructure, banking, and we can provide uh, know-how and, uh, and go hand in hand with, with Chinese firms. Infrastructure, energy, and so we also are not infrastructure, telecommunications, energy, and some of the other areas is exactly the area China and Spain are working together in a third party country or area, for example, African and Latin America. But Mr. Tui, before I ask you a question regarding that, would you like to also respond to the earlier question about the right balance Spain is trying to keep, as you observe from China's perspective, in terms of its relations with the EU vis-a-vis -vis China, and also in terms of its competition uh, with uh, some of the other European countries for Chinese investment and uh, cooperation projects? I think, yes, uh, very briefly, the answer is, uh, I think in, in, in Chinese understanding and uh, um, perspective, that I think it's a very, very, uh, I mean, uh, logic for uh, China to keep uh, uh, maybe uh, all of the constructive uh, cooperation with the European Union on one hand, and also with the member states of the European Union on the other side. Because we know so far, uh, European Union not yet a nation state. European Union uh, still it gave uh, some space for uh, member states. So China could not wait for some uh, time for European Union to take uh, every competence from its member states. Mm. So China needed to try to, of course, keep a balance is, we try to take some more pragmatic cooperation with the member states, and then we try to promote it on the level of the European Union to find uh, some more you know, common grounds and also common principles. So I, I don't think there will be some uh, a uh, big problem, maybe just like some uh, European people, European uh, media uh, mentioned it. Mm. Uh, Mr. Soto, 
as uh, the Brexit is a continuing process. Uh, many say uh, the EU, the decision-making process, will also be evolving, and therefore the voices coming from countries like Spain, will that be more relevant? And will there be more influence of Spain when it comes to EU's approach toward a big partner, which is China? Uh, your thought, briefly. Yes, uh, as we see right now, uh, the European Union is facing some uncertainties, uh, the Brexit and some situations in some other countries in the East, uh, etc. Uh, Spain is uh, working closer with France and, and, and Germany, so it's getting more leverage within the European Union. Um, so we've been for many years, and still, and from today on, even more, a, uh, one of the best, if not the best, uh, uh, friend of, of China in Europe. So we, 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 we can do something about it, and China knows that. We've been uh, um, helping each other in different moments along our m more than 40, uh, 45 years of a uh, uh, close uh, relationship. So when we've been uh, uh, helping each other and uh, uh, Spain uh, uh, stays a, is a very close friend uh, 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 and, and, and partner of, of China. And when we see an opportunity for China in Europe, we voice it in, in Brussels, in Berlin, or in Paris. And uh, so we, 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 we can have a, a continuing of this uh, uh, a very uh, um, a unique uh, contact in the future. Mm -hmm. Before we go, every one of you, 10 or 15 seconds, to you, what is a successful visit about this one? Uh, Mr. Soto, you want to go first? Uh, well, to stress one point, um, uh, among many, uh, is uh, the trust. The trust uh, also, um, the, 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 the suggestion of President Xi, and I think our President Pedro Sanchez agree on that, right. the government of Spain, that we could collaborate in global issues, in global issues as well, United Nations, the World Trade Organization, okay. and the G20, soon in Buenos Aires. All right. Uh, Mr. Tsui. Yeah, very uh, simple. That uh, on the basis of uh, uh, mutual trust, we need to get some more programmatic cooperation. And once we have some more cooperation, we do have some more trust with each other. Tsui Hong Jian, Augusto Soto, thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your insights about relations between China and Spain. Thank you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on the program. A documentary on the ties that bind the Chinese and Americans. The lowdown from the film director and producer right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. One of the most anticipated meetings on the sidelines of the G20 will take place later this week, the one between Chinese President Xi Jinping and the U.S. President Donald Trump. These two leaders hold the key to relations between China and the U.S., and the outcome of their talk will affect people living in and beyond the world's two largest economies. Trade tensions started when Trump slapped the tariffs on Chinese imports, but animosity has gone beyond the trade. In the eyes of those who view global dominance as a zero-sum game, the rise of China threatens the prosperity of the United States. But that zero-sum game view is not shared by the majority. An Oscar-winning filmmaker with his international team is on a mission to turn around the mainstream Western narrative on China as he sees it. Meet Malcolm Clark and Willem Mandel, who brought stories of ordinary Chinese and Americans to the big screen this time. The documentary calls upon the better angels in us and shines light on common Chinese and American people, such as Texan football coach in Shanghai, who realized his American dream in China, and a Chinese businessman in Iowa, who built a China-U.S. friendship house as part of his China dream. Termed as accidental diplomats, they are making a real difference. Let's take a look at the thoughts of the producer, and 
the director. There are comments suggesting it is very propagandic. I just wonder from a producer and the director's perspective, how do you see those comments? The problem with making a film on this subject today is that the, the situation has hardened so much that in America, um, if you do not make a anti-China film, an overtly anti-China film, then we are um, accused of being pro-China. Now, um, I can say for myself, and I think for, 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 for Bill also, we, we are uh, certainly not in this film trying to make a pro-China or a pro-America film. The film is pro-America and China getting along. Well, Mr. Rondell? We wanted to uh, create a call to action. Um, we wanted the American people and the Chinese people, as distinct from their governments, to become true stakeholders in what is, without a doubt, mm. the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Obviously, we've reached a critical inflection point in the U.S.-China relationship, and there's no more important time than now to have an informed citizenry. And we very explicitly took the best of America and the best of China, and we asked the question, what happens when you put those two better halves together? Having said that, though, what is it like for both of you? when you are filming the documentary, producing it, and see the bilateral relations apparently falling day by day, literally. It reinforces the message of this film. And the message of this film is that if we follow the example of the so-called accidental diplomats, mm -hmm. those ordinary Americans and ordinary Chinese who are seeking to bridge the physical and metaphysical distance that divides our two countries, that is the vehicle mm. to transform the U.S.-China relationship from one where we barely tolerate our differences to one where we can start capitalizing on our differences. So the short answer to your question is, when we see these headlines, it just reinforces that we are on the right mission mm. in this film. There are a lot of stories you told, beautiful stories from both sides in the documentary. Mm -hmm. But the question is, I mean, there are enormous amount of stories going on, undiscovered. So how are you selecting your stories? And to what extent are you selecting your stories and go deeper about that story and that person? We filmed um, 800 hours of film. We oh my God, my friend, did you? We chose one and a half hours, so the vast majority of these stories did not make it into the film. The stories that made it, made it into a film were into the film were stories which were emotionally resonant and and the and, and by implication told more than just the stories of the individuals. They they had a a, a greater and wider impact. Give so, me some examples. So, for example, the um, uh, the the the. One of the things that we had noticed as we made this film was the extraordinary price that ordinary Chinese people have paid for this economic miracle. This didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen without a lot of pain and effort and dedication on the part of the Chinese people. I don't think that Americans understand that. Mm. They don't see it. And so we wanted to tell a story which was um, uh, emotionally engaging, you know, a young man who goes to Africa, who uh, uh, separates himself from his family, who doesn't see his unborn and then born child. Those things are terribly difficult emotionally and, and they're very resonant. And then, at the same time, we see this is the price. Wait. Ah, mm. Him? 
I mean, personally, before you try to portray his story, how did you get to know him? That was a very um, expensive and arduous <laughs> piece of filmmaking. Probably the most Fortunately, complicated. Fortunately, your executive director is not sitting here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's because they're trying to figure out how to pay the bills. Um, but we, um, we had a very, very good team of, of researchers. We had an excellent uh, Chinese producer, mm -hmm. Han Yi, who um, supervised all the Chinese uh, shooting and helped very uh, uh, strongly s uh, select all these people. We don't speak Mandarin, neither Bill nor I. Yeah. And so we had to rely heavily on someone who was an experienced documentary filmmaker who could select these people to be in our film. Right. I, think, I think more broadly, um, the characters are used to shatter the myths that Americans have about China and Chinese have about America. What are and these I, myths? Well, one of the myths, as, as um, uh, our director has just said, is that there is a dark side to globalization for the Chinese people. Um, the American people certainly understand what the downside to globalization has been for them. There's been a hollowing of the middle class of America. Yeah. What we show is that the Chinese middle class, not even fully formed at this stage, still growing, is also experiencing significant disruption from their job base. Mm -hmm. Move, jobs are migrating from China to Southeast Asia. They're mo migrating from China to Africa. Right. The, the secrets in Africa that, uh, uh, that Malcolm just talked mm -hmm. about is part of a phenomena where 60 million children in China grow up without a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. That's a sociological phenomena, the likes of which the world right. has never seen. And that is something that is not widely reported in the mainstream media. It's very interesting. We always assume we are climbing the highest mountain in the world, every one of us. Mm. But we forget that every one of us around us actually is climbing as high a mountain as we are. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we are thinking with empathy and sympathy for the others as well. I, th I, think, I think the other thing is, is that the, uh, and we show this I think in the film as well, the Americans and the Chinese are, are really kindred spirits. Mm -hmm. The China of today has great similarities with America's own frontier past. Mm -hmm. uh, China today is willing to take risks that America used to take and now shies away from. And I think the, if we can harness this greater appetite for risk on the part of the Chinese and deploy that to underdeveloped areas of America, mm. to the so-called forgotten class, those long-term unemployed that were the first victims of globalization, I think that could be transformational for the U.S.-China relationship. Beautiful said, but many would say are you doing your wishful thinking? I mean, mm. are you trying to say better angels will be the guide for us for geopolitics? There is absolutely no reason why the rise of China needs to coincide with the decline of the United States. Mm. These two great countries can rise together if the leadership of both countries figure out the policies for that to happen. All right. is, is Mr. Mengdahl have wishful thinking, Mr. Clark? Mm -hmm. um, well, if he does, I share it. It's very easy to criticize anyone who tries to um, uh, bring together two great superpowers. And obviously, a 90-minute film can do very, very little. The, the problem is that the, um, the American press seems <coughs> to have been obsessed by four or five big issues, all of which are hugely important in the relationship between America and China. And they very rarely look beyond those issues. If we, um, if we can affect public opinion, all the people who have seen this film in China, and we've shown it to students and we've shown it to uh, policy makers, right. everybody has said that they agree with the philosophy, the underlying theme of the film, which is very simple. It makes no sense for two superpowers on the planet not to do everything in their power to get along. The big problem that I see, and it's something that we try to address in this film, is that I think there's a real information deficit between the two countries. 
which we try to address a little bit in the film, but the Chinese indisputably understand America way better than Americans understand China. I didn't know anything about China. I found myself on the computer looking at different things. And I would say that they're my friends. I wouldn't just call them my coworkers because when I walk through the plant, if you would notice that I'm always saying to y'all, to them, and shower hall, and they was like, won't you try the tea? And so when I have my cup and everybody see me, what are you drinking, leaves? And I say, it's Chinese tea. And I love my Chinese tea, and everybody like, she's gonna turn into a Chinese lady now. And the interesting thing is that she had never met a Chinese person in her life. Before that. Before that, yeah. and now she's working with them, and she loves them. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. She's so impressed by how hard they work, how friendly they are, and how much they, uh, they revere their family. China is in so many ways becoming what we sort of imagine ourselves to be. People go to China to get a glimpse of the future now, when it comes to infrastructure and technology. And for us in the United States, that's threatening. There are some people in this country who would like to make China an enemy. It is the greatest opportunity lost that mankind has seen. We're not yet enemies. When we think about the one place that seems to be doing us better than we are doing us, them. And they are the number two economy in the world. You've got these two countries that are in so many ways inextricably connected and yet are also deeply, philosophically, morally suspicious of each other. The question is how do we get past that suspicion? How do we get to a point where we acknowledge all the things that we have in common? People-to-people -people relations is important. It always should be in the fabric of the relationship, and yet, is it too little, too late? I, I think we shouldn't beat around the bush. I think the economic relationship between the United States and China needs to be reset. And I, I applaud President Trump for bringing this issue to a head. Uh, what I don't agree with is the method by which the administration is carrying that out right now. This singular obsession with the trade deficit, I think, is both dangerous and wrong-headed. Uh, the deficit that I worry about in the United States, it's not the trade deficit, because I think eventually the Chinese middle class will take care of that trade deficit. That trade deficit will move. I don't even worry about the fiscal deficit in the United States. We have a growing economy. Right. It's doing well. I worry about the infrastructure deficit in the United States. I worry about the fact that there are 30,000 schools in America with chip paint. I worry about the fact that we don't have a single mile of high-speed rail line in America. Mm. I worry about the fact that some of our airports, like JFK, are basically not up to 21st century standards. Mm. The easiest way to reset the economic relationship and also to close that infrastructure gap would be for China to deploy a portion of its Belt and Road Initiative to the United States. Well, we have quite a number of ideas as to how these two countries and economies and people could work together so that more common ground can be created, less fear as a result about one another. But the question is, you know, we are already, some argue, Mr. Clark, reaching this pivotal moment I mean, with the upcoming G20 summit, the two heads of state have to decide which path they would prefer these two economies and countries to grow, whether grow ever more apart, or we can turn a little bit from both sides and gear ourselves a little bit closer than we used to be over the past few years. Mm. This is a pivotal moment, and therefore the question once again come back to you. I mean, how much difference a documentary could make. Well, I don't think we can do uh, an awful lot if they choose otherwise. Uh, we have made a 90-minute film. Um, the one thing that I will um, argue for quite strongly is that um, with great respect to you and your colleagues and the Chinese media, I think you guys could do a much better job. 
I don't think you should be looking to people like Bill and I to come and make a film about China-America relations and about the Chinese Are you people. trying to turn the table, Mr. Clark? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am trying to very gently and very constructively say if China was better at telling its own story to the world, and I don't mean propaganda. That does not work. It doesn't wash in the West. We know it's propaganda and we dismiss it. Let me finish. So what I'm saying is if you guys, instead of making propaganda, would make honest-to-goodness films about the loves and hates and triumphs and failures and struggles of the Chinese people as they have brought about this extraordinary miracle in the last 30 years, if you could do that and help us do what we do, together we can tell the Chinese story to the rest of the world in a way that the world does not find suspicious or frightening, mm. but they actually admire China. Let me just add to that, because I think this is important. They said the exact same thing about another film, that it would never create the kind of dramatic change that its proponents argued it would. That film was called Inconvenient Truth. Uh, it ended up grossing $110 million on the box office, but more importantly, it changed the agenda, the environmental agenda of the largest economy of the world, the United States of America. Both of what you have just said reminds me of the fact that, for example, Mr. Clark, is not necessarily that familiar with China-U.S. relations before he's working on this movie. Mm. And yet, through the process of making the movie and working with Bill and some of your colleagues from both countries, you have become a very passionate speaker and advocate of this relationship. This must be quite a process, I would say, for you personally. How did that work? You know, um, five years ago, I, I knew very little about China. Uh, Bill asked me to make the film. It was Bill's passion and it was Bill's... Um, drive mm. that persuaded me to make the film. Um, and I Bill enjoyed, together with you, the fact that you didn't know much about China before this, and yet this is a discovering process for you. In a sense, the perfect person, because I didn't know anything. So it was tabula rasa. I was a blank sheet. I came with no preoccupations and, no pre and more important, no prejudices. And we wanted a fresh look. That was the whole idea of the film, because the old way of looking at it had been done. See, and where is the flesh look now? Well, I... Less fresh. Less fresh, <laughs> yes. Much fresher, I would argue. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm wilting a little bit. But the, but the interesting thing is I have become mm -hmm. a great admirer of mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. I don't think that China is perfect in any respect. And, I'm, and, and people who say, oh, you, mm -hmm. you've become totally pro-China. I'm not pro-China. Remember, mm -hmm. I'm English. I have no kind of dog in this fight. Mm -hmm. You know, I still give both of them a B plus. I don't give them an A because they could do better. There has never been a time where either the, both the American people and the Chinese people have been more curious about this relationship. So in that sense, the timing for the release of this film could not have been better. A film, especially a good film, is a weapon. Um, it's a weapon which can change hearts and it can change minds. What I hope for with Better Angels is that um, it, it provokes more um, soul searching in the United States and that people see it and they see a little bit of, a, of the soul of the Chinese people in this film. If we can do that and if we can show the Chinese government and the Chinese uh, film community that a film like this can change the needle, can push the needle just a little bit, um, then I think we've done, um, we, we've fulfilled our mandate, we've done a little bit to change things in the world, and frankly we can't really hope for more than that. Well, I, I would feel proud if I thought we'd done that. Better Angels, all the best to both of you thank and you, the you. movie itself. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with it's us. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank really you. enjoyed yeah. it. Two who have been working so hard on their documentary, hopefully to bring out the better angels of relations between China and the United States.
That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.